So Sarah Prager is dedicated to raising awareness of LGBTQ plus history through writing, speaking, and her app, Quist. Being able to do that is what gets her up in the morning and coffee, which I totally agree with. Her first book, Queer There and Everywhere, came out from HarperCollins Children's in May 2017. The book tells the stories of 23 individuals from queer history for a young adult audience. It received critical praise, including three starred reviews and five award nominations. Her second book, which we've been reading, Izzy and I have been reading, Rainbow Revolutionaries, 50 LGBTQ plus people who made history is an illustrated middle grade nonfiction book telling the stories of 50 more individuals from queer history that was also published by Harper Collins Children's and that was in May 2020. So happy anniversary just came last month. Mm -hmm. It's an official selection of the Junior Library Guild. And her third book in progress will be an illustrated children's picture book released by Running Press Kids in May of next year titled Kind Like Marsha, Learning from LGBTQ Plus Leaders. So she's going to spend some time today talking to us about her books. She's going to read from her books and then answer some questions. So Sarah, thank you for being here. Thank you again for having me. I live in Sturbridge, Mass. Um, so not too far away. I live with my wife and our two young kids. And um, I would love to hear a bit about you, if you could just put it in the chat instead of, we won't spend time unmuting and introducing, but optionally, if you would like to introduce yourself, I would love to hear uh, where you're from, uh, your year in school, if you are, or your role out of school, uh, and include your pronouns, if you're comfortable with that. So this is my family, uh, like right pre-COVID. <laughs> um, I haven't updated this slide apparently. So my baby is now about to turn two and our other little one is going to be five. So uh, I grew up in Connecticut and came out as lesbian when I was 14. And learning about queer history from the books in my school library that fortunately were there. Um, just a few, there weren't any for young adults, etc. cetera, yet. Uh, learning about those historical figures completely changed my life and made me feel closer to my community, uh, made me feel less alone and um, yeah, less like the only one or the first one who had ever gone through this, this being coming out and um, figuring yourself out and uh, knowing that I had these ancestors who had done so much for me to be able to live so safely and openly today as I'm privileged to do. Uh, really, really helped with all kinds of things like mental health. And so that's part of why I am so into sharing these incredible stories with the next generation. I also created um, a mobile app in 2013 that um, is currently only available for Apple products. I'm trying to get it back online for the Google Play Store. Uh, that shows you today in queer history. So if you opened it up on June 17th, it would show you things that happened June 17th, 1901, etc. So events like a law being passed or something like that. So Queer There and Everywhere is um, my YA book for teens and Rainbow Revolutionaries. It's the middle grade book for about ages eight to 12 or so. And there's some overlap in the 23 people and 50 people who are in both books. I'm gonna use the term queer tonight 
And just for the purposes of this presentation, I'm using it as a very wide umbrella term to encompass dozens and dozens and dozens of different identities. And I'm going to use it tonight to basically mean uh, anyone who is not 100% straight and or 100% cisgender. So that means like not transgender. And according to the cultural norms of any time or place. So, you know, just very broadly uh, queer. It's really tricky to assign labels to individuals in the past using our modern terms. So uh, we'll just kind of keep it broad with queer and not step into all of that. I also want to say, you know, we're talking about people from the past who have passed and things like that and the sometimes tough stuff that they went through. So some of those things might be mentioned tonight. Since I can't see the chat, if you could unmute yourself, you don't need to show your video, but uh, what do you already know about queer history? So when I say LGBTQ plus history or queer history, are there people that come to mind? Are there events or places or eras, concepts even uh, that you think about? So go ahead and let me know what comes to mind. Or um, or only oh go ahead yeah I know a little bit about the Stonewall right Stonewall? the yeah yeah what do you know about Stonewall um I recently tried to read a book to my little brother about it and um, I know that it was um, a gay bar mm -hmm. and it was a really popular place um, and became even more popular during the 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 ban on um, alcohol and stuff mm -hmm. and because of the ban on alcohol it made it easier for gay people to meet in secret and stuff mm -hmm. and there were a lot of um, protests violent ones too um but because they were fighting it back against the police who were trying to arrest them yes yeah awesome thank you uh so i kind of figured someone might say Stonewall. So here's a picture of the Stonewall Inn in New York City. So yeah, a, a queer bar with um, that is actually still in operation today, uh, functioning as a bar in Greenwich Village. So in um, the, when we talk about, the reason why we know the name Stonewall and why this, you know, the slide even exists because Stonewall is what comes to mind for a lot of people is because of the Stonewall Rebellion or the Stonewall Uprising or the Stonewall Riots that happened there in 1969. And just like you said, that was, um, it was, it was a violent protest against police harassment. So there were regular raids on the Stonewall, just like there were on all queer bars at the time. Because in 1969 US, it was illegal to be queer in just about every way. There were laws against cross-dressing. There were laws, you, you could be arrested for kissing someone of the same sex or dancing with someone of the same sex. Um, it was illegal to serve alcohol to gay people it was illegal, you know, practically to exist. Um, there wasn't a law against the identity existing, but with all of those and more laws, um, an officer could arrest you for just about anything. And a lot of times it would be something general like lewdness. So because all those things were illegal, the Stonewall Inn was an illegal, business. And so the police would come all the time and arrest people all the time. And one night in 1969, like people fought back and refused to be arrested. 
And this moment was so important that we talk about queer history in terms of pre-Stonewall and post-Stonewall. It was a major defining moment of the movement that really sparked um, so much. So there had been years of a movement before this, and it wasn't the first riot for queer rights in the US, but um, it, it was a major turning point. Um, now, does anyone know what month in 1969 this happened in? June. Yeah, it was June. And do you think that might be connected to why we celebrate Pride Month in June? Yes, it is. Um, so in, this was June 1969 that the riot happened. June 1970 was the first Pride March and it was a celebration um, and remembrance of the anniversary of what had happened one year before. And there were anniversary marches every year and that's what turned into pride parades. Um, so yeah, that is a pretty important part. And I don't wanna to spend too much time talk, talking so I'm not gonna take other things that came to folks' minds um, about queer history. We'll just go with Stonewall and we'll kind of get through that so then we can get to Q and A super quick, okay? Um, I do have two more questions for people though. The first is how far back does queer history go? What's like the earliest you can think of? I'm sorry, I can't, I can't see the chat. I don't know why it just gets hidden when I present screen. If people want to, people want to um, type in the chat, I can read them. I can read off what people write to you. That'd be great. So we have one guess for 1994. Okay. We have one guess for maybe as far back as the ancient Greeks. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, yeah, sometimes, sometimes like ancient Greeks is um, like the earliest that folks think of. Um, that is, I mean, yeah. 1980 is a guess. Huh? 1980. Okay. All right. So I'm going to give you the answer. All of human history. Look, no, we, we have no doubt that queer people have existed forever, even before the written word. Um, because we have even stone carvings and cave paintings and things like that that show um, you know, for example, this deity is one of many who presents as, you know, you can see this deity is presenting as kind of male on the left and female on the right. That's really common in a lot of indigenous um, religions and cultures where there might be a deity that embodies um, male and female in one person. So we know that that concept of male and female in one person has existed forever. And um, that's just one example of queerness, right? So have, have people heard the term two-spirit, for example? Yeah, it's nodding, great. So two-spirit refer is a modern umbrella term like queer, that refers to Native American people who, uh, you know, two spirit, meaning male and female spirit in one person, right? So um, it's a part, it's under the trans umbrella. I feel like everything's an umbrella tonight, right? Um, so in over 130 different native tribes in, the, um, in North America alone, um, there's documentation of three or more genders existing in those communities. And so the idea of um, more, gen more than two genders has existed around the world. There's many, many, many places on every inhabited continent where there were just 
there's just a, a diversity of gender identities and places where bisexuality was the norm or um, just in so many different structures of what was accepted. And, you know, for in the case of two-spirit people here in the Americas, those people were revered and honored and it was seen as a special gift and um, just a wonderful thing that these people had been blessed with more than one spirit like that. And um, so it wasn't until the arrival of Europeans to all of these indigenous cultures that the idea that one man and one woman is the only acceptable way to love and um, man and woman are the only two acceptable genders and they are um, they must align with the sex assigned at birth. So uh, those, those aren't, sometimes we hear this buzzword of those are traditional concepts. In fact, they're just European concepts. And in the pre-colonial world, that's not what was traditional um, in many ancient cultures. So, all right, final question. What do the high five and the computer have in common? And you can put it in the chat and um, we'll have it read out if you would like, or if you prefer unmute yourself for a small enough group, I don't think everyone's gonna be shouting over each other. Whoa and crazy. What? I can Home hear. and crazy. Home and crazy? Are they both invented by LGBTQ people? Yes, Carrie. Um, yes, they were actually both invented by gay men. Um, so the high five and the computer. So these two guys are in both queer there and everywhere and rainbow revolutionaries. So the inventor of the computer generally agreed to be Alan Turing. Um, so I'm going to read from the Alan Turing it for, from rainbow revolutionaries. And in rainbow revolutionaries, everybody gets a one page portrait and a one page biography. So I'm just going to read this one page little version of Alan Turing's story. World War II was raging across Europe. Alan was an academic, not a soldier. So what could he do to help his country of Britain? Alan had complete, completed advanced studies in a new field that we know today as computer science. But in the 1940s, there was no such thing as a computer. No smartphones, no laptops, no tablets, nothing with a glowing screen. The Nazis, the enemy in the war, had a secret code they used to write to each other called the Enigma Code. No human had been able to crack the code and figure out how to translate it. If the British could read what the Nazis were telling each other, they could win the war. So immediately, when the British entered the war, Allen joined a team of very smart people who began working on a way to break the Enigma code. What Alan ended up inventing with his team was the world's first computer. It could automatically check all the possible answers to the Enigma riddle and solve it. Alan called it his universal machine. With, with the universal machine, the British and their allies went on to beat the Nazis and win World War II. Alan had made a huge difference and he went back to his life of studying more about computers. There was a problem though. Alan was a man who loved other men and it was illegal to do that in 1950s Britain. When the police found out they arrested Alan and his punishment was forced medical treatment that was supposed to make him stop loving men. That is impossible to do. So it didn't work and it made Alan miserable. He died just two years later without anyone knowing about his top secret work that had helped to save thousands of lives. 
In 2013, the Queen of England officially pardoned Alan for his crime of loving another man, which is no longer illegal in Britain. Now that the public knows about what he did during the war, he is famous, loved, and appreciated all over the world. He gave us all a huge gift that changed everything. Think of Alan the next time you're on your universal, universal machine, AKA tablet. And then the inventor of the high five is Glenn Burke. Illustrations are by British artist, Sarah Papworth. So here's Glenn Burke's story. Glenn always loved sports, but he also always loved men. Being out as gay at the same time as being a professional athlete in the 1970s was almost impossible. Glenn had to hide who he was in order to live out his dream playing Major League Baseball. Glenn reached his dream in 1976 when he joined the Los Angeles Dodgers. One of the team's managers, uh, Tommy Lasorda, was homophobic and he also had a gay son, Spunky. Glenn and Spunky became so close and loved going to the Castro, an LGBTQ plus neighborhood in San Francisco. But Tommy disapproved of their relationship. Glenn was playing well for the team, but his career was in danger for something that had nothing to do with his baseball talent. While playing for the Dodgers, Glenn did something unique that would impact millions of people. He co-invented the high five. Isn't it funny to think about a time before the high five existed? Well, the one that started it all was between Glenn and a teammate, Dusty Baker, during a game in 1977. Dusty said that when Glenn put up his hand, hitting it just seemed like the thing to do. It became a baseball tradition, then popular in all sports, and then second nature everywhere as it is today. When he was called into the Dodgers general manager's office one day, Glenn assumed it was to discuss renewing his contract. Instead, he was offered an ultimatum, marry a woman or else. The general manager offered Glenn $75,000 if he would marry a woman, any woman, but Glenn refused. Shortly after, Glenn was traded to another team and then forced into early retirement at age 26. In 1982, he appeared on the National Today Show to talk openly about being gay. It was the first time any athlete had ever done that on American television. Glenn was a pioneer many years before any other athlete would come out publicly. So there are their illustrations. And I was going to wrap it up there. Uh, I have certainly more stories I could tell. Um, I have the illustrations up in another slide of a couple of trans people since these are both gay guys but it just fits so perfectly that they're two inventors like that that I love telling them together and but yeah if we're low on questions we can certainly read more stories but otherwise um I'd love to hear any questions from you how do you how do you respond when I mean maybe this maybe this hasn't happened and I'd be awesome if it has if it hasn't but with um, since your books are are geared towards younger students yeah do you ever get kind of like pushback from parents of younger students that are like oh they they're too young for this like, like how do you respond to that. So I've been surprised how, I mean, I honestly can't think of a single time I've personally encountered this. I know it happens a lot every day, but I guess people who don't want to share these books with their kids are just not. And, um, you know, I, I barely get any anything negative like that. It's really awesome. Uh, but my response in general, when people are talking about not teaching queer history to young people or about queer people to young people, um, 
there, there are a few responses. So one is that, you know, like the passages I just read, there's nothing graphic about sharing about someone's identity. I like to ask people if they think it's appropriate to share that George Washington was married to a woman, then it's also appropriate to share that, um, I don't know, Bayard Rustin had a male partner. So that is not inappropriate in any way to just share someone's identity, you know, such as we share people's identities like gender and race, et cetera. And it's not inappropriate to talk about who their partners were. Um, so that's for especially young people. When we start talking about teens, I think they not only are completely ready to hear about historical figures, um, dating lives, crushes, all of that, they it makes them much more interested in history when they do and when they can, because historical figures are were people. They were regular people um, who weren't necessarily famous in their time or, um, I mean, famous people are, are people. And so when they learn about things like dating and crushes and stuff that they dealt with as teens, their self-doubt, their diary entries, their, um, yeah, their struggles. Teens can relate to that and start to understand these people from another angle. And so I have a chapter, uh, one of the 23 people in Queer There and Everywhere, which is the teen one, is about Abraham Lincoln. And it talks about his relationship with another man, Joshua Fry Speed. Um, and, you know, it also mentions uh, his wife, Mary Todd, and talking about what those relationships were like is, it, yeah, it, it makes teens interested. And it is also relevant towards understanding the full person about um, if any of these historical figures might have made certain decisions because of their identities or things like that. So we should always know the full picture. Um, and then if someone was just saying it's not appropriate for young kids to learn about queer people, not even just history, um, I mean, that's silly on many levels because young people are queer themselves. My four-year-old and one-year-old are just fine with it. Um, having two moms, um, it's, we're talking about everything always at age appropriate levels. So knowing that I am married to a woman is not, that's not um, anything secret that you need to be at a certain age to know about, just like if I were married to a man, it wouldn't be, so. Thanks. Yep. My, my, my wife wanted to come tonight. She's an elementary school teacher um, mm -hmm. in a different town. Um, and she's, she's run into some, some kind of issues like that we've been, we're talking about, about age, age appropriateness of, you know, celebrating pride um, yeah. and teaching content like this. Um, I mean, I'm having a pride party in my backyard for preschoolers this weekend. Um, we're inviting some two mom families over for Father's Day. Um, and the age appropriate way, ways to celebrate Pride Month, like the things that I'm doing at this preschool pride party, the kids are all between one and five. Um, we are having a story time station with picture books where, I mean, there are dozens of picture books with LGBTQ representation. I just got in the mail today. Um, uh, what's his name? Peanut Goes for the Gold, which is about a non-binary guinea pig gymnast. So like, you know, to a kid, it's 
a guinea pig gymnast. And it's great representation that this guinea pig uses they, them pronouns. And that's it. What's, what's inappropriate about that? Um, we're having face painting. We're having coloring pages. We're also having make your own signs because we're also going to do a parade around the backyard. So, um, and then mimosas for the moms. So, uh, and then everything rainbow, which is just fun. And as they get older, they can start to learn like the meaning of the, the struggle that like the rainbow flag can represent and things like that. But I mean, for kids, like just be like, it's a celebration of diversity. So uh, just like they might learn about different cultures at different the times of different holidays of like I don't know maybe they don't celebrate Hanukkah in their house but they're going to learn about Hanukkah or something like that you just are like isn't it great that everyone families are all different and people are all different and I mean yeah there are age appropriate versions of of everything um and so for kids it's just yeah People are unique and we love that and we love rainbows. So. That was a great question. And I want to add to that because um, Mr. Billadu, I've noticed working in Aesop's Fable that a lot of teachers come in with their gift cards and a lot of them buy books, especially in the past year or year and a half on diverse topics and they seek them out purposefully but there are very few LGBTQ plus children's books that are part of those sales, at least in my personal experience. And I did have one conversation with an elementary teacher. It was probably a year ago. Um, she came in with her class gift cards and she bought books about ability and race and culture and even um, economic diversity. And I handed her a book about I forget which book it was. It maybe it was I Am Jazz or something like that, like that. But um, she put it down and specifically said, I'm not sure I feel comfortable discussing this with my elementary kids. And so I do think that it's a challenge for teachers just because their comfort level isn't there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, my um they it it it's kind of the the duality of yes, we're gonna you know, support this and, and make kids aware of, you know, people different than them. But then at the same time, we're going to not actually do that. Um, it's kind of this, like, kind of like what you were, exactly what you were saying, like, oh, I, I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to quite do this. I'm going to put this book back and not quite, I'm going to address it, but not address it. I will say, I know, I understand that the difference between those different um but their ability class race etc that um you know sexual orientation sexuality like the connection to sex and romantic attraction and that kind of stuff is why you people would be afraid to discuss this with young children uh, like I understand that that's where the difference is coming from and I think if we look at it as identity instead uh, of like, I identify as lesbian and we, for very young children can divorce that from any kind of sexual attraction and just talk about um, love or um, even without that, just being like, it's part of who I am to be a lesbian. We barely need to talk about it for with if we just simply expose the idea that that people can be different in different ways like the kinds of families they have um we can also uh and i also completely understand that a teacher might be comfortable but they fear the the reaction of parents who also associate LGBTQ identity um, purely with 
sex acts and how are we going to teach that in elementary school so uh the you know i i see in the news this year multiple times um teachers have been fired for just reading children's picture books about uh like a trans kid um and you know they're published children's picture books yep that's the one <laughs> uh and you know that's these books are challenged um in the school libraries and um i think it's important for school administrations to make it clear to teachers that they have their back about this and empower teachers um to make the call for inclusion um because it's not uh it's not simply not going above and beyond for inclusion to put that book back when you're making efforts to um, include others because students notice when all the other months are celebrated and Pride Month is not. And students notice when they first hear of LGBTQ people years beyond when they could have heard about it through a simple children's picture book and they know and they, they feel like it's something wrong and secret and taboo because no one is talking about like if you label it as inappropriate they'll feel like being this way is inappropriate and that's not only an issue for um, fostering homophobia and transphobia, et cetera, in non-queer students, but self-loathing in queer students who are coming out to themselves in elementary school. Right. It's not, people don't come out, people come out to themselves as adults all the time, but the average coming out age in terms of sexual orientation has been dropping from high school to middle school to elementary school um, just in my lifetime it was already like 12 when i came out at 14. so uh for trans kids um and non-trans kids like children know their gender identity often around preschool age like the kids that are coming like um so that's a natural part of development is your is knowing your gender identity in around preschoolish and then starting to know your sexual identity around like middle schoolish um so it's not like they're not talking about it with their friends thinking about it about themselves all of those things like the only it's not like they're not discussing lgbtq identities um they're just getting a message that it's not okay to talk about in your classroom except for awesome gsa advisors <laughs> yeah my wife got fed up with the admin and decided to just she just bought a bunch of pride shirts and she's been wearing some variant of a pride shirt every single day to work and they're like don't talk about it with the kids and kids have been asking her about the shirts and she just keeps right on going so she's really sorry she couldn't be here she's like oh that's awesome the last day of school yeah well that's a awesome point is that you know if you can't talk about it um or you know are not supposed to um having a poster a button a sticker uh, a shirt books around um even like brochures and stuff uh you know if it's not the spoken word there are there are other ways and especially even if you're not going to open a full class discussion for the kids who are figuring out that they are queer um to know that to see the little um sticker on your door or poster on your wall that lets them know that that you're someone that they could talk to about that 
or even if they don't need to talk, just seeing that, it makes a big difference. I think that we've done a really good job in Holliston. So I know that Placentino and Miller now have had safe schools from the state come in and do some trainings and I feel like I feel very happy with the level of support and there's always more to be done but we're moving in the right direction thank you Sarah yeah thank you